our communion this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that as we consider uh, this uh, next step in the journey of our, uh, our uh, this passage on uh, church blueprints, I pray and ask, Father, that you would please just speak to our hearts here today and just grow us in our understanding of who you are, understanding what your purpose in the church that you've given us uh, to, as a responsibility for and in care of, I should say, in this season between your, your comings. I pray and ask, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would please just uh, be with us today. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Eric uh, Schlosser wrote a book that turned into a movie on Netflix called Fast Food Nation, in which he uh, exposed the dark side of the fast food industry. And at one point, he described a food production line or plant that travel, that runs 24 hours a day, 310 days a year, turning potatoes into french fries. He had some interesting things to say about the process. He said conveyor belts took the weight, or took the wet, rather, clean potatoes into a machine that blasted them with steam for 12 seconds, boiled the water under their skins, and exploded the skins off. Then the potatoes were pumped into a preheat tank and shot through a lamb water gun knife. They emerged as shoestring fries. Four video cameras scrutinized them from different angles, looking for flaws. When a french fry with a blemish was detected, an optical sorting machine time sequenced a single burst of compressed air that knocked the bad fry off the production line and onto a separate conveyor belt, which carried it to a machine with tiny automated knives that precisely removed the blemish. And when the fry was returned, then the fry was returned to the main production line. Sprays of hot water blanched the fries, gusts of hot air dried them, and 25,000 pounds of boiling oil fried them to a slight crisp. Air cooled by compressed ammonia gas quickly froze them. A computerized sorter divided them into six pound batches and a device that spun like an out of control lazy Susan used centrifugal force to align the French fries so that they all pointed in the same direction. The fries were sealed in a brown bag, then the bags were loaded by robots into a cardboard boxes, and the boxes were stacked by robots onto wooden pallets. And what's the end goal? Millions and millions of French fries that looked and tasted exactly the same. Now, I look at that and think that is a feat of engineering, and I would like to see that, and I would love to know the engineering minds that produce such a magnificent uh, process, and yet at the same time, I want to say, but aren't you glad that God is not into making French fries? <laughs> because when you look at what God has created, it doesn't look all the same, and they don't all taste the same, and they don't all look the same, and they don't all think the same when He makes virtually anything. Look at a rose bush. Two roses on the same rose bush look the same, but also very different when you get into the details. It's something of His God's creativity. Think about uh, even a dog or a cat that comes from the same litter. They maybe look similar, but they aren't the same. God is creative. Look at two kids, as I could look at my own family, who come out of uh, the same parents in the same household, and yet the personalities and the looks and the interests and the, everything else is just so vastly, vastly different. And it's also true of when God calls people to salvation. When he saves people, he doesn't save people that all look exactly the same, one right after another, like a, a batch of french fries. And, and if you go have any questions about that, go to a Bible study in which you discuss a passage of Scripture together. Isn't it absolutely bewildering how different people's perspectives are? Now, sometimes they're just wrong because they don't agree with me, but that's okay. <laughs> sometimes it's just a matter of a difference of perspective that people have and come at it from a little different angle, and we need to work those things out. And it, However, when churches go ahead and uh, form churches, uh, sometimes we cannot appreciate that differences of personality types and differences of stations in life and all that, and sometimes churches ignore all that and they they try to make it into a bunch of french fries that all look and act the same. Uh, one of those was back in the 90s. Uh, I won't uh, have a crusade against him or his philosophy, but Rick Warren in the Purpose Driven Church, many of you probably read The Purpose Driven Life. When I was in Bible college and seminary, everybody was reading Purpose Driven Church. They had a very specific target group of people that they were trying to reach for the, for the uh, uh, church that they were planting at, Saddleback Community Church. 
They had a picture of him, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he was well-educated. He liked his job. He likes where he lives. His health and his fitness are high priorities for him and his family. Rather it be in a large group than a small one. He was very skeptical of organized religion. He likes contemporary music. He thinks he's enjoying life more than five years ago. He's self-satisfied, even smug, about his station in life. He prefers the casual and informal over the formal. He's overextended in both time and money. And apparently that's what he looks like back in the 90s with the pager and all in the ridiculous cell phone that you see there as well. <laughs> this was Saddleback Sam. This was the one that they were trying to reach. They had a profile. Now, what kind of a church do you get when you profile somebody like this? You get a, a church full of french fries is what you get. You get people that look like this and have these values and this mindset and this philosophy of life. And I don't want to get in a crusade, as I said, against Rick Warren, because honestly, it was the gro church growth philosophy of that era totally. You pigeonholed who you're going to reach. The philosophy was birds of a feather flock together, and there's some truth to that. There's a part of it I can get. Some years ago, I went to a pastor's conference in which it was a very narrow band of focused in with people of a very similar theological outlook. Everybody there, you probably agreed on about 95% of all the issues, even the debatable doctrinal issues in the Bible. They probably, 90% of them were carrying the same translation of the scripture. I mean, it was kind of like we were all very, very similar about our ministry philosophy and all of those sorts of things. There's a certain comfort in that. Everybody's thinking the same way. Everybody knows where we stand on X, Y, or Z debatable issue within the church. But the problem, again, is that you produce a church that's full of fast food french fries, and it doesn't reflect the creativity of those that God actually saves by his grace through his sovereignty. And it's interesting to think about this in terms of actually when God actually chose uh, to save people and to bring a people to himself, he didn't choose the french fries. He chose some pretty interesting, different kind of people. It's certainly true of his disciples. Uh, you see that in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 uh, through 4. I'll put it up on the screen, and you have it in your Bibles as well. When he calls these 12 apostles, not much is known about these guys, but there's a couple of things, uh, a couple of giveaways that would have revealed some pretty interesting differences between them. It says there, Matthew chapter 10, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and is John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, Th and Thytus, Thetis, well, you be the good judge, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, for the next three years, these men were going to have their lives turned upside down when Jesus called them. He was going to invite them to follow him, to sit at his feet, to te uh, hear his teaching, to watch his miracles, to participate in his ministries. They were no longer going to be focused in on what they normally would have been, their jobs and their hobbies and their communities, and to some degree, even their families for this intense time of learning. They were all sitting at Jesus' feet, called to Jesus, to himself, to be centered around him. And yet, when you look at these 12 men, you see uh, a couple of them that had some really strong differences. One of them would be Matthew, the tax collector, versus Simon, the zealot. Now, tax collectors were despised for numerous reasons. Uh, one of them was their dishonesty. Uh, they collected a little more tax than the Roman government required, and they would pocket that money. But what tax collector is probably even more so in Jewish culture was is that they worked for the bad guys. They worked for the Roman government. They were collecting money from their own brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, and shipping that money off to Rome. This was an overwhelming traitor uh, act. <laughs> you know, who are they working for? Do they love their fellow Jews enough to, to look out for them, or are they working for those guys? And then you have, on the other hand, not just Matthew, the tax collector, you have Simon the Zealot. A zealot is about a mere image of tax collector in terms of their philosophy about Rome. Tax collectors worked for Rome. Zealous hated the fact that there was any Roman presence in Israel at all. As a matter of fact, about 30 years later, around 60, mid-60s AD, there arose a revolt within Israel trying to remove the Romans, particularly the Romans out of Jerusalem, which led to a big war, which led to Roman to Rome to clamp down on them in about 70 AD, in which they destroyed the temple and, and, and uh, the city of Jerusalem. The, the zealots lived by the philosophy that if you could kill a Roman, do it. 
Take your chance. And so can you imagine that as they're <clears throat> gathered into this group of 12 that Jesus has gathered and handpicked, you can imagine the awkward conversations around the campfire when Matthew and Simon finally got seated next to each other and they talked about their philosophies of life. And one says, well, yeah, I'm a government employee. And the other says, how could you work for those rotten, evil people? I can't imagine how you could even think about doing something like that. And yet, this is who Jesus chose in his inner circle of 12. And the question I think that we could ask is, why? Why did Jesus do that? Why did he so radically choose or so, choose such radically different men? Because if you're going to make a cohesive group that seems to fit together really well or work together really well, you're probably going to have you know, Saddleback Sam. You're probably going to get a target group. You're probably going to try to aim in on those types of people and only get those types of people. That produces cohesion within the group. It's easier to get people to come to a church where there's lots of other people that look like them. It's a faster growth process. It's easier to maintain unity with people that all think and look alike. So why would Jesus... Uh, not just uh, in his band of brothers, why would he not just pick people that are all alike in their philosophy? Well, because I think, I think the answer here is that Jesus wanted his disciples to be formed around him, not something else. Group C always has some sort of glue that holds people together, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a church, whether it's a club, whether it's a community group, and sometimes it's economic status, sometimes it's their political views, sometimes it's their age range and that sort of a thing, or sometimes it's a mutual interest. Even so-called today that we have so many inclusivity concerns, you know, and all those sorts of things, they're not really that inclusive. If you're not within their philosophy, you're out. You're, you're excluded very quickly. Groups uh, usually form cohesion by excluding other people out. And, and for Christians, Jesus wanted to be that glue. He wanted to be the center. He wanted to be the bond. It's what would form these disciples around Jesus Christ in a relationship with him, and that is their bond, and it would be the kind of place where Jesus could be honored and glorified in the midst of uh, some very different people. And you know what? That's true of the 12 apostles, and it's true today. You could flip over to the book of Ephesians. We'll be looking at that just for a few verses there as well. But just if you scan through the early chapters of the book of Ephesians, what we see is that God is still in the process of choosing people to bring into his church family, into the saved, those who know him. In chapter 1, it tells us that in verse 4 that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that, that God is choosing. And then in chapter 2, we find out some of those people that God is choosing to save and bringing to life through the power of his spirit. In chapter 2, it speaks of, in verses 11 through 18 or 22, the end, of the, the end of that chapter, it speaks of the Jews and the Gentiles being brought together into one new body in Christ. Now, if you think to yourself for a moment that that's not that big of a deal, that's a big deal. Verse 15, he speaks of the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles being torn down in Christ so that they could become one new man in Christ. That's a big deal. That, that would be like plopping most of us down in the inner city Chicago of a church there where the people speak English as their second language and maybe they're very different ethnic background than us, very different experiences that we have and sticking us in the same church and saying, you both know Jesus, so why don't you worship the Lord and grow together? It could be a real challenge. It could be a real uncomfortable thing. And yet that's exactly what God is doing within the church. He's not making fast food french fries. He is unifying different people, but not unifying around the idea of diversity, unifying around the person of Jesus Christ in a mutual relationship and connection with him. But if you're going to have that kind of unity in the church, you know what the problem is. <clears throat> it's the problem that the New Testament deals with constantly, and that is it produces challenges. It produces conflicts. It produces people that don't necessarily care for one another and all that they've experienced and all the ways in which they live. And how do we keep that unity that God is forming in the church? And that's where we get to Ephesians chapter 4, which gives us the, the key, the key to preserving the unity in the church. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Notice the one, 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 one. It's as if to say God is forming a unity by saving all these different people, bringing them to faith in Christ, and forming them in a body called the, the church of the living God. And out of that unity, though, he says how we can maintain or how we must be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, 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 bond of peace. Other translations say make every effort to maintain the unity of the bond of peace. In other words... God has brought about a unity by bringing us to Christ and faith in Christ, but it's our stewardship, our responsibility to partner with the Holy Spirit to eagerly seek the unity, to maintain that unity, to work hard at it with God's power, to make it a priority. And Paul even goes as far to say, if you want to live worthy of the calling, you have to try to seek it. You have to try to maintain it. You have to try to pursue it. So we should be the kind of people that are slow to take offense. We should be the kind of people that are quick to seek a resolution. We should be the kind of people that are not fast to abandon relationships as soon as there is something bad that happens in there. We, but to be these eager unity uh, seekers, we also need the work of the Holy Spirit to form our character. So he mentions at least four qualities in there. Notice the first one when he says that we should have all humility, verse 2. Humility. <clears throat> to not be arrogant. Lowly of mind, quite literally, the word means. We were to have a humility before God, of course, because he's God and we're not, and we've received salvation purely by grace through faith. But we also have to have humility before our other brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's very easy not to have humility, isn't it? It's our default not to have humility. It's easy to be full of self, to think that we have the best ideas, that we have the better abilities. It's it, it, one of the telltale signs of somebody that doesn't live out humility is they're unable to receive correction. They're, they're not open to receiving correction. Instead, they just immediately become defensive or offensive towards people. But if we're going to have a church that has the bond of uh, 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 the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, we have to be people that are growing by the Spirit of God in humility in our lives. It's essential. Notice also in verse 2, he speaks about that idea of gentleness. Gentleness is the opposite of harshness. This is an attitude in which no one uses force to, to get their own way. This is uh, con sometimes being concerned. Somebody who's gentle is concerned about how actions and attitudes affect other people, people that are careful with their words. Gentleness is necessary as well. And notice also he, he speaks of there of needing patience. Other translations say long-suffering. The idea is that of endurance. It's interesting that in uh, Old Testament times, one place where uh, uh, this, uh, uh, in Greek, when it's translated uh, from, the Greek, uh, from Hebrew, uh, Old Testament times, there was be referring to a, a city under siege that plants turnips with the thought that they will see these turnips grow from the seed into a plant that would, they would be able to eat it. You know, they're under siege as a city. That's the kind of endurance, the long-suffering, the thinking that we're here for the long haul. And that's the attitude we have to have with relationships and with people. Is it ever right to give up on somebody that's uh, hurt us or something? I don't know that give up is the right word. There may be times when you have to change your tactics and how you relate to them. You might need to give them space. You might need some space. There might be times in which uh, somebody wanders from the faith, maybe a child of yours, and you have to give them that space of uh, the, playing the part of the prodigal son. But you can still be very committed to them even when there's physical distance or there isn't a lot of connection. And one of those ways is by continuing to pray for them, continuing to ask the Lord's blessing upon them to eventually bring back a restored relationship that's been lost. It also says, notice that it, uh, in verse uh, 3 that we need to, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 2, patience, but also bearing with one another in love. Some people will just rub you the wrong way. Not every personality is going to just be a click with you. Uh, not every personality is going to be easy for you. 
Uh, th there's going to be people that are tough to enjoy. So just basically put up with them. <laughs> Tolerate them. Don't get bent out of shape by them. You might remember if you have some people in your life that you find very challenging to be around, or even with the body of Christ, remember you're probably that person to somebody else. I remember once listening to a gal in a former church context, and she came to me, and, and she told me, and she went on a rant for about 10 or 15 minutes, telling me all the things that was wrong about the church, everything that was wrong about the church. They did this. They don't do this. They don't have this kind of ministry. They don't do these things, and this person really irritates me, and this person said this and that and all that, and I sat there because I had quite a while to think about it as she was ranting at me. I thought, what am I going to say? So I said, I knew this gal for like seven, eight years before that, so we had built quite a relationship. So I said, you know what? You're probably right, actually, about 90% of what she said. Yeah, you probably are. And then I appealed to her. I said, but you know what? You're pretty annoying yourself. <laughs> and I said, everybody has put up with you so beautifully and wonderfully over these years. Remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? Remember when we helped you with this, even though you were very challenging at times? We had that kind of relationship, that kind of uh, give and take that we could have. And you know what? By the grace of God, she actually stayed with the church, and she actually became quite a bit easier to deal with in the church because we had this, this conversation. She admitted it. But sometimes we do. We need to bear with. We need these qualities. If you're going to maintain, verse 3, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, you better have humility, you better have gentleness, you better be growing in patience, and you better be growing with the ability to put up with people because if you don't have those things, I don't care whether it's a marriage, whether it's a church, whether it's a workplace environment, whether it's whatever, you're not going to be able to maintain the unity. It takes a lot of grace and a lot of wideness of heart towards people who are very different and think differently and talk differently and have different patterns and different ideas that you have to work through those differences. And I'm not saying avoid them, although sometimes you just don't need to bring certain things up. Uh, the things that do need to be brought up, sometimes we work through them carefully and slowly. You know, we all naturally gravitate to people who look like us, and we like it when the french fries all look pretty much the same in the, in the box. But it's, and it's easier to maintain the unity of the body and the bond of peace with people that we just gel with. But I gotta say, I don't think God's deepest concern in the body of Christ is that we all look alike or all think in uniformity on all things. Because he chooses to save all sorts of people who are very, very different from one another. And then he forms them into the body of Christ in a place called the church. And it just strikes me that maybe one of the points of this strange way in which God is working is, is not so much just to make us happy or make us comfortable, but, but perhaps he's trying to grow holiness within us. Perhaps those relationships that bother us a little bit, he's trying to shape us by the Holy Spirit, to rough off, sand off a few of our rough edges, to teach us what it really means to love somebody. Jesus said on one occasion, if you love somebody that loves you, big deal. Any unbeliever can do that. But you need the Holy Spirit inside of you and walking with him to love people that maybe you don't have much in common with or even frustrate you in some uh, measure. We're transformed when we live in this body and learn to walk in these qualities one degree more into the very image and likeness of Christ via the Spirit. And Christ is seen via the Spirit more easily in our lives. And I would say that that kind of church where the Holy Spirit is reigning in our hearts and we're extending grace and love and patience and wideness towards one another, I think that's a church where Jesus stands at the center of it and he becomes the true glue of that community. That it's a community formed around him and a relationship with him, not around something else that even the world can come up with. Let's pray. Father, I pray and ask uh, for us as a body, Father, as we have such a differences and so many uh, 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 different backgrounds, although we agree on the big stuff for sure. Lord, I pray and ask for those personality conflicts and those differences of backgrounds and perspectives. I pray, Lord, that we would have a generosity, a wideness of heart towards each other in these areas. I pray that on secondary issues, you'd have the wisdom to know where are the primary doctrinal issues we all must unite and where are the secondary issues in which we must respectfully disagree. And I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that seek, seek resolution to conflicts. And in some cases, when we'd have the wisdom to know, as it says in Proverbs, that it's a glory for a man to overlook an offense. I pray that we'd have those wisdoms too, that wisdom too. 
And I pray and ask, Father, that you would just form us into your church that uh, continually reflects the fact that what only holds us together is nothing short of your son, Jesus Christ, and our relationship with him. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be partaking of communion, which is actually a symbol of our unity in Christ. We sing it take of the same loaf, so to speak, or the same cup, so to speak, the same meal together. It's a, a testimony to the fact that we have a connection and a relationship with Jesus Christ, and because of that relationship with Christ, we have this unity that comes by His Spirit, not by any of the world's standards. Um, if you are uh, someone who has trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you would know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have salvation, not because of what you've done, but simply by receiving through faith the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. We invite you to partake of the table. You don't have to be a member here, but we do ask that this is a proclamation of our faith in Christ, a profession of our faith. So if you don't have yet that faith, that confidence of who Jesus is, it's no shame in just letting that pass. Uh, but if you do have a relationship with Christ, please feel free to partake. And I'd also say this question rises often about how young should people uh, 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 partake. Well, I would leave that up to the parents to know, does your child know Christ? Do they have a relationship with Christ? And do they know what they're doing in the process of partaking of this meal? So we'll just kind of pass the plates, and when we pass it, we'll just have the parents make sure to be the, the ones who determine which kid knows that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and which um, does not. So go ahead, and uh, I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink 